All right, good morning, good afternoon, or even good evening, everyone, uh, wherever you are. Welcome to this edition of the Key Industry Transfer Creative Agencies in 2024 webinar. Um, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Jimmy Wu. I will be your host this morning, um, or this afternoon, or this evening. Um, I am very lucky to be joined by our panelists, Todd, Lori, and Jenny, but before we do get started, I'm just seeing a lot of people trickling in. Um, so maybe perhaps we'll give it another 30 seconds uh, for everyone to join. In the meantime, um, if you do have, um, if you this is the first time you're using GoToWebinar, um, please know that we will be recording this. So you can always share this or access this afterwards and we'll be emailing the link to everyone. Um, there is also a questions panel in your go to meeting control panel. There's a question section. So throughout the webinar, if you have any questions on any of the um, discussions that are the, any of the items being discussed during the webinar, feel free to ask that. Uh, my partner in crime, Talia, will be helping us through that uh, throughout the webinar. Um, cool. All right. Let me just share my screen here. All right, can everyone see my screen? Just wanna make sure. Awesome. Well, let's get started. So welcome, welcome. So once again, uh, my name is Jimmy Wu. I'm from Function Fox and I'm joined here by Talia who is from Function Point. I'm very excited because this is the first time Function Point and Function Fox are partnering together uh, for this industry trend report. Um, I, do, I am also joined by our panelists. We have Todd, Lori, and Jenny that it will be um thank you for joining the webinar here folks you're welcome all right so to go through the agenda today uh we'll have todd Lurie, and jenny uh introduce themselves a little bit talk a little bit about who function point and function fox are and then we'll dive right into some of the findings we have and uh on the industry report we will try to leave some time at the end uh, about 10 minutes for the audience to ask any questions and answers once again in your GoToWebinar control panel there is a question section so feel free to type the questions throughout the webinar so um a little bit about myself i'm the coo at function fox been working in the creative industry for about 25 years now um used to be a project manager uh wasn't too good at it but decided you know i like the industry a lot so decided to sell a product that uh that will help um scale and uh the creative industry uh but my i'm joined by my partner in crime talia talia do you want to introduce yourself a little bit here yeah thanks jimmy um yes my name is talia i am the product manager here at function point and um i've been with function point for coming up on four years um I work with developers and marketing and the CX team in sales to really align everybody around a product that meets the needs of the industry. And so that's definitely why the, the industry report is near and dear to my heart. <laughs> so excited for the conversations today. I will, uh, as Jimmy mentioned, be on the question side of things. So I'll be responding to any questions or saving them for a little later in our, our QA portion at the end of the call. If you don't hear back from me quite right away, might be a good one I wanna pitch to everybody. <laughs> All right, perfect. Thanks, Talia. Um, so a little bit about Function Point and Function Fox. We are an all-in-one agency management software um, designed for creative agencies. Now, what's interesting is Function Fox is more for your startup and boutique agencies that might want something a little bit simpler um, without the complexities, whereas Function Point is more robust and designed for the larger studios and agencies out there. Um, so. Um, we do manage things from all the way from CRM estimating to project management, resource management, agency financials, and reporting. So combines all of your agency's workflow management process into one place. So that's my elevator pitch, and that's all you're going to hear about Function Point and Function Fox today. But without further ado, uh, Lori, Jenny, and Todd, thank you. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for your patience. Sure. Um, yeah, so we're very lucky to have um, all of them to join us today combined, they have over 100 years of agency experience. So I'm sure everyone has went through some ups and downs and evolved with the industry. So I'm excited to 
that you'll be really sharing all your insights and experiences with us today. But um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Maybe, Lori, let's start with you. Uh, tell, who, who, sure. who is Second Wind? Sure, absolutely. Thanks for having me today, Jimmy. I always enjoy these sessions. Uh, Laurie Micus with Second Wind, and we are an organization that serves smaller to mid-sized agencies. We're membership-based. We offer content, training, networking, um, you know, advice, guidance, consulting, anything that you may need as a smaller to mid-sized agency to really help you grow, uh, do better, and reach those goals. And as we all know, this is an exciting, dynamic industry. So lots of things to consider and, and discuss and, and think about as you move forward. And, and that's really what Second Wind tries to help you do, cut through the clutter and get to the information that's important and really vital uh, to making those business decisions. So thank you. Lori, I'm not sure if you remember, but I did actually attend a course about 12 years ago at Second Wind, uh, one of the account management courses. And I have to say it was very insightful and really helped me look at creative business in a much different way. So yeah i do remember well thank you for that yeah um jenny tell us a little bit about yourself and deep fried love the company hey, everybody. okay yeah well thank you for inviting me to be here today i'm a huge function point fan um drink the kool-aid um i am uh i started deep fried 20 years ago so this is our 20th year that we're entering it's pretty exciting um and when you asked us to join this webinar it really came at an interesting time um because we had just prepared a state of the company and have a lot of exciting things that we're looking forward to in 2024 a lot of adapting and and so um really excited to share some insights with you guys today um we're new orleans based uh, we also have a new office in baton rouge and uh, we service small to large size businesses um, of a variety of industries we do a lot in economic development nonprofit, healthcare coastal and environmental restoration um, and restaurants and CPG. So uh, kind of cover a lot of ground over here. So well, nice definitely support. sounds like a full service agency there. All right, last but not least, Todd from Crowbar. Yeah, hi guys. Um, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Todd Kinley. I founded Crowbar in 2004. Uh, I've been on the creative side since we were talking earlier. 1983. It's been a long, long trip. We've we've also, as Jenny mentioned, gone through a lot of uh, exciting changes. We became a remote agency right after COVID and have never looked back or haven't looked back since. We specialize in commercial and residential uh, furnishings. We also have some other accounts, but that's kind of our niche that we, we, um, we specialize in. We have about 30 people on staff and uh, I just did a, a study over the last four or five years and we've grown I think 24% every year. So that's, we've been very lucky in that regard. So happy to be here and happy to answer questions. All right, sounds good. Um, welcome, welcome. Well, let's uh, get this started. Um, so to talk a little bit about the industry report. Um, so it does go through, if you have um, read it, you'll see that there's different trends in the industry. We focus on the profitability of agencies, talk a little bit about the productivity and efficiencies on the operational side. And then of course, with tech stack, focusing a lot on AI this year as well. And what's that impact on agencies? So the people that we surveyed, uh, what's very cool is the majority of the survey respondents have over 10 years in the industry. So they are very experienced. They've gone through different economic ups and downs and technology shifts. Um, the roles, range from owners to project managers to accounts um, to finance and it is a report focused on the small to medium-sized businesses as most of the respondents are between one to a hundred employees okay so you got your startups to the mid-size and the um, and most of the agencies are comprised of full services um, there are other specialized such as design pr firms and digital firms in there as well so let's take a look at the first trend, starting with the trends. Looking at the different services. Um, so in one of the questions we do ask is, you know, what do you see uh, our existing demand for the current industry? What's high, medium versus low? And then which type of services do they foresee growing as well? So if we focus on the top right quadrant, we're gonna see that um, the strategy consulting, the design and branding, 
are the services that people feel are in high demand and will continue to be. Whereas things like SEO, advertising, copywriting, while they do have good demand, but they're gonna be staying flat. So I'm curious to hear from the panelists, maybe Todd, we'll start with you, you know, with strategy, you know, when strategy, consulting, design and branding increasing in demand, but I'm curious to hear what are you seeing at your agency on the different services out there? Yeah, creating content, you know, is king for us. I mean, we have video and photography. We brought that in house um, so we could create lots of content. Um, you know, we do a lot of website work and we are seeing a lot of total rebrands because I feel like a lot of manufacturers are merging and there's a lot of acquisitions going on. So we're having to filter through different brand sets to create unique brands uh, that are more flexible to them, the growing, um, mar you know, those companies growing. And I also see PR shrinking, um, but those categories are, I definitely see in my industry, my categories uh, growing. I also find it interesting that you're bringing things like video production and all these services in-house as well. But um, Jenny, are you seeing the same type of trends too? Or how, what do you see at DeepRide? Yeah, we are. Um, we also brought um, video production in-house um, about four years ago. And um, what we're really seeing now is just like a major shift in audience behavior and the types of content that um, that consumers want. They're, just, they're looking for authenticity. They're looking for short form content, um, entertaining content. And I think one of the biggest challenges is helping the brands that we represent figure out how to adapt to that demand and figure out creative ways for them to meet the consumers where they are. Um, so really, I think it's it's pushing creativity um, and at the end of the day, the, the great creative is going to win. And um, I think that's going to be how we're going to help them deliver on their goals. And I want to make a point, uh, Jenny, you're, you're targeting consumers. We're targeting designers, architects. So we're a little bit business to business, very similar to what you're doing. Um, but we do have that, that niche just so everybody knows you're more consumer than we are. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, since you bring more of these um, services in house, have you, you know, in the past, there's been a lot of conversations on whether you should outsource. Um, I know this is a big uh, passion of Lori, Lori's. So I'm curious to hear from your perspective, what have you seen in terms of quality? Is that something you really enjoy? You felt like it was a good or a decision for the business? Absolutely. And, you know, when you sent out the questions ahead of time, the first thing I wrote down when you said video production, you know, is on the increase was many agencies have now taken this in-house. Um, it's more accessible, it's easier to produce, the format is a lot shorter than it used to be when you had to outsource it. So I think that that's really been a benefit because, you know, we can now really control pricing um, and we can control the quality of those deliverables and, and, you know, teach our staff new skills or hire relevant staff. I think the other part of this that's interesting, the upper right quadrant really shows me two areas that clients have never really been very good at, and that is the strategy and the consulting and the design and the branding. So they're still really relying on agencies for some of those core competencies that we've always had. Um, and we can still really bring to the table and outshine them. I mean, a lot of them can do marketing automation now. Not that we don't wanna do that, but it is a skill that they can execute um, on their own. Again, it may not fit with the overall goals of the plan and it may go rogue occasionally but you know having everything is best but strategy and consulting design and branding is still where agencies really shine and clients fall down many times so i'm not surprised to see that in the upper right quadrant in terms of demand future demand still continuing to remain high or even increase awesome awesome well that leads really well because you mentioned about things um, the in-house teams and the, our clients are getting better at some of these fundamental um, services that we use to provide. So I think the, for the next part, another thing we ask is, what is the main challenge uh, as a business for you? For you, mm -hmm. And the number one, overwhelmingly, for people, for customers to move away from using the agency services is that they shift their work to in-house, just like Todd, Jenny, you're bringing that video production in-house and those services in-house, it seems like the customers are also doing the same thing. Um, furthermore, um, relating to that, when we look at whether agencies track client satisfaction, um, 
most people just do it through regular phone calls, emails, but there's quite a bit, of, there's still a good 20% um, of the agencies that don't even track client satisfaction. So I'm curious to hear, you know, maybe Jenny, we'll start with you. To, are you seeing this as well in the past? Has this been a challenge and how have you, um, how do you track your customer satisfaction so you come up with better strategies to keep your clients? Yeah, I thought this was a really great question, and and there's a there's a lot to unpack in it. Um, I mean, we we absolutely felt the effects of recent years with COVID and risk of recession, and we had Hurricane Ida down here in New Orleans, and went through a lot of setbacks, um, the Great Resignation and inflation and the cost of salaries, and then you battle the fear of not um, of of increasing your rates at the risk of losing clients. And um, it's a lot of challenges that we've all faced. And, you know, I really went into this year looking at it um, with a really positive take about innovating um, and exploring new services. Um, the way we say it around the office here is that we're aging backwards. Um, we want to really, we can't just rely on all of the traditional services that we are accustomed to offering. Um, and so, uh, I think at the end of the day, what it all comes down to is value for the clients. I mean, we have a responsibility to be amazing um, client service providers to our clients and really listening to them and really understanding what their goals are. Um, even if you aren't like understanding with them what, um, if you aren't like speaking to them directly about what these things are, I think a lot of the time, you know, you can challenge yourself to say like, are we really helping these clients reach their potential? And um, so one of the things that I think that's a big value, it's not just um, it's not just price cutting or doing it cheaper. Um, the clients have goals and we need to figure out how to help how to reach them. Um, that might mean producing more and decreasing a turnaround time, like leveraging these tools in responsible ways to help us do that. Um, providing value can mean a lot of different things to the client. So um, we really can't be afraid to do that. And if you ever have the opportunities, I mean, it's kind of like the cobbler has no shoes. Um, it's it's hard to spend time as agencies actually going and marketing yourself. And so I think that's a really big component of it too. Todd, I see you definitely nodding your head yeah. there. Yeah, I mean, do, doing stuff for yourself is super hard because you always push clients ahead of the work you do for yourself. Um, I will say that that this is probably the most important question that you guys have asked because you have got to have great relationships with your clients you've got to talk to them constantly get a feel for how they're doing what their pain points are what there is as jenny mentioned their goals uh you've got to come up with new solutions you've got to you've just got to be there for them so i mean i could tell you every one of my clients what their what their attitudes are with the work we're doing and you also have to shift and renegotiate what they may want to do in-house versus what you're doing in-house we've yeah. got we do website we do all you know we have clients we do everything for we have some clients that want to have their um, in-house some part of what we do right or they may want it one quarter back to us another quarter uh, not that that happens very often but you know we want to be and we've had clients for you know over 12 13 years and that's how we've kept those clients been with them through the through the low points and been with them through the high points and the only way to get through that is to know them and really talk to them and be their partners um yeah so that's just been i mean we you just have to do that oh it sounds like you're embracing the fact that your customers just might be outsourcing and you're, uh, I'm sorry, bringing it in-house. So, you know, if you're gonna do it, let me work with you actually and partner with your in-house team instead. It sounds like what that's what you're doing and a big strategy for that. Oh yeah, I mean, we've had, we've, we've had three divisions of a company that then took uh, some part of that to a corporate level. And I mean, you know, you just have to swallow your pride and say, Okay, what can we? How can we be your humble servant to take you to the next level? And and they'll see your work as you do that. And they they sometimes make the make the call that they made the wrong decision, and you make you get it back. So ultimately, is is again as Jenny said, you have to find their goals out and service them, and keep your creative and the work that you do at the highest possible level and customer service at the highest and and the most professional way possible. It's just the ticket to not just survive, but to thrive, to me. Absolutely. I think if we cried over every piece of business that went in-house with a client, 
you know, we'd be feeling sorry for ourselves all the time. So we have to, you know, find a way to work with clients. And that, again, is where that strategy comes into play is if we can show a client a strategy and how everything fits together, even if they take a piece of that because they hired a marketing automation manager, I'll use that example again. Well, we want to work with them to help them facilitate that successfully. They may lose that marketing automation manager and that work is going to come right back to the agency. So, you know, as far as work going in house, Yes, has there been an increase over the years? Absolutely. I don't think it's anything 100% new, but by embracing it and still working with our clients and providing that guidance um, that they need to achieve the goals in tandem is what really makes for the healthiest and most successful relationships. And just want to say one thing about the charts on the screen. Um, I think in the pie chart to the right, I do think that you know, 53% are checking in regularly by phone or email, which is a function of account service anyway. So I think we have to do that. But I think only 14% are doing customer surveys. And I do think that's a lost opportunity to do these regularly, whether it's annually or at the end of a contract term to really formalize kind of a process and ask a client a very specific series of questions that we can get feedback to, to really help us evaluate our performance across all of our clients. Some of those regular conversations, that information doesn't get distributed around the agency. It's really for the account team's ears only. And we all need to benefit from that. And I think that's where surveys can be very valuable if agencies have a vehicle to be able to collect that information on a regular basis. Curious to hear, um, Todd, Jenny, how are you collecting um, or doing a pulse check with your own customers, so. Well, it, you, you want me to go, Jenny? Yeah, go ahead and I'll go after you. I, I, uh, I would not send a survey to my clients because that feels very pedestrian. I would have an hour long conversation with them. It's just, that's just the way I like to work. And so it, uh, it and, and I've relied, I should say I rely very, very heavily on the account service and the creative director because they're in constant touch with those with those clients so you know th th i think that's a tricky one-on-one -on -one, i guess situation maybe because i'm a smaller boutique agency and if you get to a certain level then you have to have that survey so that, that's just a i want to throw that out there for a discussion mm -hmm. i've done surveys and it's been a little while and the problem with getting a survey is that if you if you don't know and it's anonymous and you don't know like who it's coming from, it's hard to affect change on it. Um, I'm, I'm all about the one to one conversations. Um, we created a process here that I call account health. And one of the things that we had to do was start actually letting go of certain clients. Um, we had to make the hard decision to to recognize when a client wasn't profitable for us and we were hiring people to service work that wasn't you know covering the margins that we needed them to do and a lot of the time it could come down to something simple like you know feeling appreciated or having a good relationship so we kind of um made a set of 15 questions that are of a few different categories but you can move through and just kind of ask yourself is this a yes or no or maybe so like are we would we put this work in our portfolio is this something like does the does the client appreciate us do i feel that this client would give us a testimonial um do i want to go back to this client and do more can we do more for them do we talk about how we can spend additional dollars like how good is our communication so it triggers a lot of these questions and it's helped us to see which ones we've kind of put a number to these things and it's just a, a quick visual so that we can understand um who are the ones that we really value those opinions more deeply from the ones that we really want to go and say okay like how can we be better for you how where do we need to innovate where do you think that we're falling short i think it's really hard to be able to offer yourself up for those kinds of candid conversations and sometimes you have to consider who the right person is to have the conversation so that they feel that they can give you radical candor in return but um i think it's really important to do so yeah i just talked to um yeah. oh, oh sorry laurie did you want to no i was just going to say to you know jenny's point is it's such an interesting way to look at that information to determine do we want to continue to work with a client versus does a client want to continue to work with us and todd to your comment i couldn't agree more you know we don't want to make this mechanical we don't simply want to send out a survey monkey you know choose what feels right for you if it is something online absolutely if not 
I think by survey, we want to at least try to ask our clients a series of regular questions so that we can gauge our performance from client to client over a period of time, whether it's every year, every six months, et cetera. So if you can do it one-on-one -on -one and your clients are willing to have those conversations with you, absolutely, that would be best. If not, do what you can do to gather that feedback on a regular basis. Yeah, we, we had a, have a client in Germany that is owned by an Indian family that has marketing director in the UK and we were presenting this video for them and we've got very granular feedback and so I felt like talk about you know client relations I had to call the marketing director and say okay you have an American CEO right that's another complicated factor how do you want us to pitch creative and how do we handle your team when it needs to be granular and that's just something that you can't think of across all clients it's just something very unique so I just think you have to be very I, I, I agree with you Laurie and and Jenny too that if you had some kind of general list that you need to check off I love that idea but you also need to be open-minded about is there the right chemistry are we getting the right feedback with the right people that maybe are better marketers than some of the associate marketing people. So uh, all that's in play to me. I love the conversation, by the way, Jenny, you brought up about firing, uh, you know, whether we want to continue working with a client or firing the client. So which leads very well into our next point around over servicing clients. So I don't think there's any surprise, I think, on the data here that's 73% of the respondents felt that they over service their clients on a regular basis. Um, however, we further asked them this year, you know, which areas, what type of services do you find over servicing happens more often than others? Um, so what we found is that design and branding, web development and strategy consulting were the top three. Whereas things like copywriting, social media management, you know, things that have been around for a really long time, we don't over service as much. Um, so curious to hear from maybe Lori, we'll start with you this time. Um, what are you work with so many different agencies? How do you deal with over? Are you seeing the same trends? Um, and how are they dealing with over servicing specifically to these type of services? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think over-servicing has many different components. Um, first and foremost, a lot of it is tied to scope and scope creep, um, not really understanding what we have promised or promised to deliver um, to a client as part of the initial estimate or the initial conversation. So, you know, we spend a lot of time doing things that maybe we didn't intend to do um, or we don't estimate well to begin with. So we might not allow the appropriate amount of time for a designer to come up with a concept or execute those concepts. So, you know, if we're not estimating well, if we're not providing the appropriate scope, if we're not, you know, making sure that we're sticking with our retainers um, that we have estimated, that is going to potentially lead to over-servicing or expending hours we cannot bill for. On the other side um, of the coin is over-servicing can many times be tied to not watching the work, you know, just not tracking it appropriately as it moves through the channel. We may feel like we're spending the appropriate amount of time, but if we're not watching those hours and watching the work move through the channel, we may be putting more time in than was really allotted or allocated for that work. So we've got you know, actions we have to take on the front end to make sure we know the scope, we know the time um, investment it's gonna take to do this work, and then we gotta watch it like a hawk on the back end to make sure that we are sticking to that. But these areas, design, branding, web development, strategy, consulting, there's a lot of intellect involved in time for these ideas and things to percolate. So I'm not surprised um, that these are areas that are oftentimes over service. Social media management, we may say, well, we're gonna give you 10 hours a month and we can stick to that if we're watching it closely enough. So I'm not surprised that these are some of the areas and over servicing again is really nothing new, but handling it on the front end, during and after really can help to minimize some of that. Jenny, what about yourself? Are you seeing the same trends at your agency? Um, I am. In some in some cases, I do. I think I, I was going to throw in some of the a couple other things that end up really taking a lot of time for us. Our name consultations. That's a really difficult one to like put a put a real definable scope on. And if you're doing media buying jobs at too low of margins or those kinds of things like that, those kind of, they, they can just really take a lot of time. Um, I find that a lot of the time it's the things that the clients don't 
really value that they think that they can do themselves. So there's a big education component when you're doing that scoping. Um, back to kind of like what Lori was saying, estimating is really hard and it's super time consuming. Um, it's easy to rush through it. And then, you know, you, you go to a creative team and ask them for a silver platter, but you're really giving them like a salad plate of hours. Um, so the daily time entries, like the time police, I hate being the time police. It sucks, but, um, but it is really helpful for us to understand where jobs are. And we always, you know, I would say we're, we're probably quarterly or monthly just reminding the teams that the whole point of the time entries is for us to understand how long it takes for us to produce something so that we can go back and look at it and say, you know, next time we work with this client, we're going to need to like increase the budget by 30% in account management because that component of it just really takes a lot of time. It, that data, the knowledge is power. Um, we also find that like dedicated production management role is a really important role for us. Um, that that role for us really helps to run interference between our account and creative teams so that they aren't climbing on top of each other and like self-prioritizing. Like we have to come to agreements and make sure that everybody like feels good. And after they've done their stand-ups that they actually feel like they can accomplish something um, and, you know, deliver with positive results. And then I also think that a lot of it comes down to really like thanking our team members and making sure that we value their well-being and making sure they understand like, what these clients that we're working really hard for do for our agency and our paychecks at the end of the day. So, you know, that level of transparency, I think, is really helpful, too. Yes. I mean, uh, time tracking is always our favorite part of the day, right, at the end of the day. <laughs> uh, Todd, I'm curious, uh, how, how, how about for your agency, what do you experience? So uh, we found that over the life cycle of a client, it's kind of a bell curve that that we're over in time in the beginning. And then as we get to know the client and the client starts to trust us, our time is lowered. But in that, in that time period, we could have a thing called a success, a success equation, meaning how's the client feeling about it? Uh, is this super important to us for our portfolio? Do we wanna spend more time on it? Who, what, what creative person should be working on it? What level? So there's a lot of conversations in between uh, each job. And we, we do a lot of value-based estimating uh, based on a year long plan for a client that we know has a budget. And we know we're gonna be over in that video because it's so important to them, but they may not wanna pay, you know, the president of the company may not wanna pay that much for that video, but the marketing director really wants it. So we're doing them a solid by making sure they get the, the whiz bang video they're, they're after. So it's this success equation along the way, but we always over service. I would much rather be, over serving and, and pull the time from function fox and see then show the client look here's how much we've given you guys invested in this relationship month to month you know if they if they if they want to come back and and lower the retainer or lower the projects then i've got that that overtime to go back and show show them say well you're gonna have to take away some projects mm -hmm. you know and then it becomes a, a better negotiating tool for us when we over deliver all right. Well, it sounds like there is a common theme, especially Jenny and uh, um, Todd, um, around the tools that you use, which will help with the over servicing. So one interesting set I do want to bring out is, you know, when we ask, when, when we segment the respondents on people who use silo tools um, or manual tools versus an integrated tool like Function Point or Function Fox, where you can see the whole workflow together in one system, you do have a lower chance of over servicing. So only 67% compared to 84%. So that it's actually about 17, almost twice as low compared to others. Mm -hmm. oh. But speaking of which, um, causes. So Laurie, you mentioned about communication and setting the right expectation with the clients are really key. Um, which is interesting because the number one barrier people say about projects completing on time or on budget is inaccurate project scope, not getting all the information properly to start, clients changing their minds. Um, what strategies, I'm curious, I, I don't think any of this is new, but I'm curious to hear what strategies do you recommend for addressing clients who, who don't like to because they're not educated, for example, they haven't had as much experience in this field, so they don't know what information to private, provide you in a timely manner. So what are your strategies that you recommend? Um, 
Well, I think clients who are not educated, of course, the onus is on the agency to try to help educate those clients as much as possible about how all of this works. You know, how do we get from point A to point B? What is the what are the requirements? What's the necessary information that we need uh, to be able to put all of these pieces together? So some level of education, if you feel yourself in front of a client that has never worked with an agency before or might have a very limited experience with agencies. So do what you can to educate them about the process and then show them how you work as an agency as part of all of your onboarding with them. The second strategy um, I would say is because it's really the account service team um, who is deeply involved in gathering this input um, in the initial stages with the client and the principal maybe as well and the new business person maybe as well, but we have to really develop a process within our agency that says, this is the way we gather input. These are the types of questions we ask our clients. This is when we need to talk to them about delving for more information and research and do we have what we need to move forward. So the less guesswork you can take out of it for your team and the more of a process you can create um, within the agency and a culture of understanding how important that input is, especially at the very beginning, because everything you do from then on, estimate, proposal, it's gonna be based on that input to make sure people understand how to get that. And that, again, is the responsibility of the account service team. So give them the tools, give them the training, give them the process they need to have those conversations and be alert to when the client may have certain changes in tone or body language, that things don't quite seem right. We have to address those things head on versus letting them languish because we have a sense that the client doesn't feel something is right or we're not doing what they want. If we don't address that then and now, six weeks down the road, we're gonna end up with a lot of comps back in the hands of our creatives and they're not gonna be happy. So we wanna make sure that we address things early and as proactively as possible as well. And, and again, the onus of a lot of this is on the account service team. So we wanna make sure that we give them the tools they need to succeed. Just don't send them out there uh, in the dark without a light. Um, let's make sure that we've got them trained and up to speed. And the younger ones can learn by watching the more experienced ones. I like the body language part, by the way. Uh, in this digital world with so many right. people remote, I feel like body language, you know, there's a stat in the past, 72% of the communication actually is through body language. So that's actually really big. But um, Todd, I'm curious to hear what, what, from your perspective and experience. Yeah, we, we call it the grunt test. Right, so if the client goes, huh, we know we've got more work to do. If they go, I love it, then we're obviously off to the races, you know. Um, I, I think we approach things, I'm a creative by nature. So we, we, we try to have a partner, a real strong partnership. I've worked for accounts, when I, before I had Crowbar, account driven agencies and I've worked for a creative driven agency. So we don't we want to be both of those. So we have real strong left brain strategic account executives and and super you know creative creative directors, but they need they're working together to try to gather what we know the client's not going to have all the information. We just know that. They're they are strung out basically internally with the data they you know they're trying to do. They're they're undermanned also you know, over there to, to start with. So we try to help them even go gather some of the data points they're not, they don't have. So we just start a job knowing we don't have all the, all the data points we need and try to work it as we go towards that finish line. Um, it's just, just part of the process. And, and, you know, we could, we could wait till the creative brief is finished. Then we'd never get the job done. We kind of have to do it as we're doing it, you know, and that's just part of the, that's just the way I think our creative is in this industry, um, coming from the creative side. You know, a lot of creatives when they when they they come, you know, or I've talked to them, they expect a full, detailed, complete creative brief. I mean, that will happen, but a lot of times it don't, it doesn't happen, and we still have to hit that deadline. So the more work we can do to save our evenings and weekends, it's just going to benefit us. So it, it is a struggle, but it's it's also just the way the industry is. I feel like we're in this industry. If you you almost have to embrace that part, right? You um, do. You really have to embrace it. Jenny, I'm curious. Do you have a grunt test at Deep Fried? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I really like that though. I might have to bring it back to the team. Um, yeah, I think for us, um, 
you know, we don't sell widgets, unfortunately. In my next lifetime, I think I'm gonna make a business that sells widgets because it would be a, a whole lot easier, at least from my perspective. So all of these custom proposals are really difficult. Um, so something that we've been really working on is pre-qualifying the client so that uh, and doing a better job of selling job like actually not even getting to the proposal and and fine line estimating phase until we really feel like the client is a pre-qualified client which then in turn allows us to spend more time getting the deliverables right and documenting the scopes better so um that's been a helpful tool for us um it's just there's no, nothing worse than giving out free proposals so um, using function point data to inform those. Um, we also, like almost everybody at Deep Fried is um, set up as a project manager so that they can go in and build schedule templates. I might not be getting that uh, permission exactly right, like what's checked off, you know, but it's really important to us that those, th those on the creative and interactive teams who are producing are very engaged in the estimating process so that they can speak to those those fine line deliverables and make sure that that scope is clear. And the more that the people who really own that process are tied to the sales process, the more that it, it helps for us, us to really give the client the silver platter with um, with the right price. So um, I think a lot of it is preparing the client for how hard it's going to be too. Um, so that when you, when you start that kickoff and discovery, um, you've got a client team that's onboarded and, and ready to participate in the process um, because there's just always going to be something like they, they it's a two-way straight um, getting client sign offs on the brief if possible is helpful you can't always pull it off just like Todd was saying um, but when possible that can also be really helpful just to get it right from the beginning and not you know haste makes waste so yeah 100 yeah, um, I love the discussions thus far the next part is going to be my favorite and about AI. So AI has hit us like a storm, not the first time, you know, digital marketing internet has also done that for us in the past. Um, so in this survey, when we talk about uh, um, pretty much every single agency, the majority of the agencies use AI to an extent. Okay. Um, over two thirds are already utilizing it, whether it's weekly, daily, or monthly. Um, so, and what they found, the areas that have been most helpful in improving their efficiencies is around copywriting, um, you know, social media management, the design and branding, but copywriting by far leads the pack. And I'm sure ChatGPT uh, is going to be part of that as well. So what's, what's overwhelmingly positive is that 96% of the AI users experience improved efficiency after using AI. So I'm curious, um, does Jenny, Todd, Laurie, when you, for your agencies, does, do you utilize AI right now? Why or why not? And how do you anticipate, you know, AI impacting your business and the trend to evolve? Uh, maybe Todd, let's start with you. Yeah, so we, um, I just happen to have this, um, we use it, uh, I, we use it everywhere. I mean, we use it. We're doing voiceovers. We're uh, taking, we're we're getting soundtracks that have a voice in the soundtrack. Being able to remove that voice, we're using it for podcasts where it does quick editing, camera cuts back and forth. We're using it uh, for proofing. Um, we're using it. I mean, we created this magazine cover with text prompts. You know, I mean, and then we in the magazine wrote about it. Uh, one of the account executives is presenting to our industry that we work in, you know, helping them with AI. So to me, it's just a great time to be in this business because there's so much at it's 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 just such great tools. Now we did have a a copywriter that's been with us for five or six years to kind of she was in tears because she was so afraid. And so I think that the challenge is sometimes is embrace all that. If you're a copywriter in the industry you need to leverage AI in your daily, you know, daily work. And so it's just been a lot of fun. We have actually a Slack channel that's AI that we all find new ways to do a Photoshop or, you know, whatever. And we're, we're posting it for everybody to kind of look through it. Um, so it's just a great time to be in the business. And I think it's going to, I haven't seen it uh, affect our, 
our, how our clients judge us. And I think, I think eventually they may ask for, you know, reductions in fees because they think our, our services are, you know, uh, becoming uh, quicker. But, uh, you know, I will say that, that we think we're going to become more tastemasters, more branding, more, you know, gurus of what they need to have it look like and feel like and sound like. And that has to be where the agency's value comes in. Because it's just like when, you know, Jimmy, when I, we were talking, I remember when we started moving away or moving to digital, you know, uh, finished art, right? And everybody said, well, everybody's going to have a Macintosh. So everybody's going to be designers. So you don't, you know, graphic designers are going away. Well, that didn't happen. Actually, it became more important to be a, you know, graphic designer that actually could make something look good. Just because you have the tools doesn't mean you can produce good marketing and branding. I love that part. Uh, the tool, It is just a tool, it sounds like, uh, AI for your business. Lori, you work with hundreds of agencies. Curious to see what you're hearing um, and seeing it with them. Yeah, I mean, it's similar to your survey results. I think that with any technology, there are early adopters and there are those who are willing to kind of run with it and see how they can use it and optimize it within their businesses. And then there's others who are sort of slow um, to step on board. And I think we've seen that across Second Wind um, in general. Uh, you know, people are using, and we've been using in general as an industry AI in a number of ways that, you know, might not even be noticeable on the surface data analysis and thing targeting and things of that nature. But these more recent developments, the, the generation of images and the generation of copy um, is something that really kind of hit home with many agencies because that's very much on the surface of what we do on a daily basis. So I think that many are experimenting. They're not quite sure how deep they want to go yet, how much they want to use it. I think that there is some fear surrounding um, copyright infringement issues, um, the lack of ownership of the output of any machine generated, um, you know, AI tool. Um, anyone else could use something similar that was generated. Um, from an AI tool. So I think for agencies, some of these issues kind of hit home at the core of our being, and that is we create unique work, um, you know, that is protected under copyright uh, and trademark law if appropriate. So I think those some of those with some of these newer tools with these ideation, et cetera, um, scares some of our member agencies. But in general, everyone's trying it. <laughs> seeing what they can do with it, even if it's just to help them generate some ideas. You know, hey, chat GPT, write something for me, 500 words on this, and then they're going to take it and rewrite it. Maybe they're looking for structure. One thing I will say before we go to Jenny is some agencies have started using AI for things like writing case studies. You know, you feed the information in, and something that is, you know, just a black cloud over our, our heads for months and months and months, we don't do them. They can spit it out in a matter of minutes. So a way to create some of these things that we don't necessarily like to do, but we want to do, um, you could use it in cases like that. And there it's just re-spitting out your results and the information that you input. So I think there's lots of ways to use it. And I think Todd, you know, early adopter right there, perfect example of, you know, an agency who's jumped in and is really experimenting, which I think you need to do with AI, not to mention it's going to continue to change every day. Jenny, how about for yourself at DeepFi, do you utilize AI and uh, how, how has, yeah, how, how do you yeah. approach it? Yeah, I mean, everything that Todd and Lori just said, um, I mean, I feel like we might go back and listen to this conversation in two years and laugh at what we're saying about it right now because it's coming on us so fast, you know? Um, but I mean, our teams use it all the time. Um, I think, you know, exactly like Todd was saying, copywriters and everybody needs to, they really need to dive in. It's not going anywhere. Um, what is moving at a fast pace is what it's capable of doing and, and understanding what, um, what the implications are of using it and what responsible use of AI means. Um, we, we have a couple uh, team members here who have really taken the lead on implementing it and teaching others um, you know, functional ways to use it um, where you're sort of like unlocking creative resources, but not using it to produce everything. It's been really helpful for us um, when we, a lot of time we'll have like a kickoff or discovery where we have to meet with anywhere from six to 20 individuals. We've got a big intake of information. You got a lot of people taking notes 
and you get a lot of opinions and you need to come and like you know produce pieces so um, if you give it a voice and, and you tell it what it needs to sound like it's really helpful for developing frameworks for us and kind of like synthesizing that information so that's been helpful um, I know that our dev team really enjoys using it for like troubleshooting troubleshooting things that are sort of unknown territory um, and kind of refactoring code or translating errors into simple English. Um, so it's really fun for that kind of neat, um, just when you feel like you're looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, yeah, all those other things. I think at the end of the day, um, we know that it's not going anywhere and it's all about figuring out how to work smarter and not harder. I love it for the case studies thing, Lori. I think that's a great idea. Like, yeah, I thought it was too. <laughs> we, it'll allow us to be the great American editors when we need to and, you know, like put our creative uh, energies into the things that really require the creativity. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh, I, I realize we only have about 10 minutes left here, but I really want to make sure I do want to leave some time for the audience to ask questions, but we taught there was um mention about policies around AI, you know, it's just out in the world and it's quite scary, you know, is there copyright infringement? So right now, the majority, they don't have policies or anything like that. It's so new, but they do encourage the use of AI. Um, so I'm curious, do you have any policies? I mean, Todd, Jenny, both of you sound like you do promote use of AI usage at work. Um, what type of policies have you implemented or have you done that yet? I'll go. All of ours are verbal right now. We're in the middle of rolling out um, a new employee handbook, and um, I'm a big believer in documenting the 20% of the things that cover the 80% of your needs, and AI needs a policy. Um, I appreciated this question being asked because it's sort of a little, little fire for me that we need to have a policy. Um, I've already got an idea of who I think will willingly take it and i think you you need a point person to be able to stay aware of what's going on and and have these things constantly being updated and, and like shared out i think this one is one that absolutely requires having a written policy not just like verbal parameters set around it Todd, how about yourself yeah i'll say that it's going both ways like for this cover um tanner who was pitching to our industry was the first presenter was a lawyer who said, you know, even though the, the the way we generated this gave us the rights to use it, we now can copyright that. You know, we now can copyright the image that we created because of the variation and the prompts that we created. So, mm -hmm. a lot of the the um, services that that that, that were uh, using AI has the legal documentation that says, as long as you're a subscriber you have the rights to use this you know but but for our protection too it's also how do we protect what we've created for our clients so it's going both ways for the for the policy i still feel it's a little bit like i just want to be protected of the stuff we use that's my biggest thing right now and then i think the policy is going to well and this may be naive but it's going to work its way work its you know way through the system i think you're right jenny in two years we're going to laugh at this conversation because it's going to be standardized you know, but right now it's kind of the wild west, but I just want to protect our clients and ourselves when we use copy images, voiceovers, things like that. It's 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 a tough question. I think it's a great question. Lori, 30 seconds. Yeah, there's still a lot that needs to be discovered and I think resolved and I agree. I think it needs to be a written policy. It's going to be an ever evolving and changing policy, but just like everything else when, hey, social media came around, we all implemented social media policies within our agencies. When people got cell phones, we started implementing cell phone policies. So I think it's just a, a matter of the way things are and we have to put some parameters and controls around how we use it for our clients and how we use it for the agency. So I don't know what that policy is yet. We've taken a couple stabs at it, but every time we go back and look at it, we think, well, you know, hey, it was okay yesterday, but now it looks like it needs to change. So maybe AI can help us write it. <laughs> we made that joke earlier, like maybe one of y'all can send us one of your policies and then we went, maybe we just need AI to write it for us, so. Right, right. <laughs> oh, uh, too good. Well, thank you all for all the insights. Um, so we have about six minutes left here. Um, Helen, do we have questions from the audience here? We sure do. We have a couple of really great questions. Um, 
going back to our conversation around um, bringing video work in-house, there's a really interesting observation that came up that um, while agencies are trending in bringing videos in-house, we also see clients bringing their work in-house as well. And sort of this thought that maybe those two trends are related and contributing factors to both. Do you have any thoughts on that? Hmm. I think it's hard for clients to bring in all our services. So they may bring in a portion, but they still need a variation of our services. Um, unless, I mean, unless they want to go full agency in-house, um, which then it doesn't matter, right? Because we won't work with them. Um, For me, I feel like, um, well, we, we have video production in-house and we use that for a lot of uh, short form content and up to commercial production. We also hire a lot of crews. So we're producing in-house, but it doesn't necessarily mean that like, we're not bringing in DPs or you know unique roles for a lot of these key functions. So to Todd's point, I don't think they're necessarily bringing all those in. And then what it kind of comes back to is, I mean, we've got more and more clients who are coming to us for strategy. When we looked at that first chart at the beginning of this and the industry trends, and you've got like strategic consulting up here in the top right. I think at the end of the day, like what what is always going to be a big need is coming to us for. Um, providing strategic insight into how to make these things really work for us to a changing you know customer audience so absolutely okay i have another question here relating to um and i think it ties in in nicely are you seeing any trends around pricing models for agencies at the moment for example are agencies moving away from hours to a full project rate or a subscription based model mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question, and, and we see a lot of agencies trying a variety of things, and that subscription model, actually, mentioning that is something that we have seen um, just in the last couple of years, you know, providing, just the way they're selling it, it's not necessarily, you know, how we're compensated, we'd still be compensated on a monthly basis for a certain amount of deliverables or hours that we're going to provide for the client, but the client is signing on to an ongoing kind of subscription. Um, for these items. So yes, that is something that agencies are are testing. I don't know that many are, but I've had some conversations with agencies about it. And then of course, there's always been this discussion on value-based pricing and how do we get beyond the estimate each and every time? How do we know, you know what it takes us to do something specific and where we're gonna break even or we're going to make money and then, then when is that number not enough? When do we charge based on the value that it's actually bringing to the client, either in the immediate or in the long term? So value-based pricing, and I think subscriptions, you know, our, our world is filled with subscriptions. It doesn't surprise me that agencies are considering compensation in that way as well. Yeah, value-based pricing, is, it's so tough. I mean, you really, um, you have to put the fear behind you. Um, to really enter into that territory. And um, for us, we're seeing a lot. I feel like I see um, a retainer leave and then a new one come in. Um, I, I'm seeing more of a need on the retainers to be Swiss Army knives, to be um, an extension of the marketing arm, to put hours in on a rolling basis that allow for a rolling list of priorities, that um, being an extension of that marketing team where we can meet with the client weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, quarterly, and say, all right, like we've got these three initiatives and you're kind of like constantly rolling into the next ones. So flexibility uh, for the clients, as opposed to, you know, here's your 40 hours a month for social media contracts, like um, being able to do more and then them use us where we're really, really needed. That's the trend that I'm seeing. And and more project work. I mean, there's more confidence in, you know, knowing the cost of one project and the deliverables that you get at the end. So I, I think we have as many I, I, go, oh, ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. Ahead. I was just gonna say we have as many setups as we have clients. Everybody is unique in how we bill, how the val what their value perception is our teams, so it's it's really every every client has a different need. So our setups are always different. Okay, we are at, we have one minute left. Perhaps Talia, one last question, and then we'll wrap it up. 
I heard an interesting overlap there of specificity of, of estimates. And I have a question here. What do you do with a client who has a substantial budget, but they cannot give you a direction uh, or make a decision to save their lives? <laughs> How do we handle those? And can I write down the company that has that problem? <laughs> Take the money and run is all I can think of. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think sometimes you have to give them a, one or two things that you start with and get a response and get a buy-in on that. Um, you, you know, I, you can do the dance a lot of the time of what you're going to start with. What do you want? Well, you know, it's our responsibility to make a recommendation as to what they really need. So I agree. Um, I think I more clients wanting that. Yeah. Yeah. I think you should act like the client at that point. Like it's it's my money. What yeah. do I, what do we want to do? And then you just, as Jenny said, you just, you just run with it. They don't know well here's what you do with it mm -hmm. yep yep show, show your value as an agency that's that strategy strategic part of it well if you don't know well here's here's why you came to us we're going to tell you mm -hmm. all right well thank you everyone i know uh, you know we are at the top of the hour and uh, i'm sure we can continue this for another two three hours if we wanted to uh, but i want you to thank you know, Todd, Lori, Jenny for joining and Talia for co-hosting this with me. Um, if you want to learn a little bit about Function Point and Function Fox, feel free to visit our website. Uh, if you'd like to learn a little bit about Lori and Second Wind, um, you know, that contact information will be on the um, email follow-up that we'll be sending to everyone. Um, you will, if you have not, there are a lot of other insights on the industry report you can definitely take a look at. So feel free to go and download it on either of our websites. Um, but thank you all for joining. I uh, thank you for your time and hope you all have a great rest of the day. You're welcome. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Nice to meet you. Yep, you too. Bye.